thank God for Jesus. What if you would open your Bibles, Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 20 and then verse 26 through 33. And uh, you might feel like this is an extended passage of Scripture. I'm trying to make up for those of you who haven't been as faithful in your Bible reading this week. <laughs> this will salve your cautious and help you make up for lost time. Numbers chapter 13, beginning with verse 17, notice the word of the Lord. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not. Be of good courage, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. In verse 26, Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and are very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. This is Journey to Victory, Part 4. As we conclude this series on the journey to victory, victory is a journey. It began with where we talked about the voice. Everything in the economy of God begins with a voice. God calls us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. He calls us into ministry. He calls us into business. He calls us into government. Wherever we are supposed to be in life, there's a call to come there. That's what a vocation is. The word vocari, it means a calling, to call. An avocation, which we say is a hobby, is a calling away but a calling. What are you called to do? It begins with a cause. So there's a voice. It begins with a voice. And the voice leads us to vision. Vision is a result of the, of the calling that we got because of the words, because words create images. And so when God begins to speak, you begin to get an image of what God wants to say to you. But it begins with a word. Abraham heard God telling him, Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation of you. Your seed are going to be mighty in the earth. But faith for that didn't really rise up in Abraham's heart until God gave him a vision and showed him the stars and said, Look, you see those stars? That's the way your descendants are going to be. You see the grains of sand? That's the way your descendants are going to be. Until Abraham received a picture of what God had been saying, he didn't have faith. Faith came when he saw what God was saying. Faith is the vision of God. He had heard it with his ears, but the real faith didn't come until he saw it. Nine months after he had that experience is the time that his child was born. Isaac came into the world as a result of vision. There was a voice, then there was vision, 
then there comes valor. Valor is the courage that is necessary for all of the opposition that you're going to receive in the midst of trying to birth the vision that God has given to you. Don't think that you can get a vision from God and then everything is just going to just flow like, you know, as smooth as butter after that. Smooth as silk. No, no, it doesn't happen that way. You get a vision and you get so much opposition and there will be so many negative things that will happen to make it look like your vision will never come to pass. There will be stumbling blocks. Every time that God gives you a vision of a promised land, there's going to be a red sea of problems. Sea, a red sea. Red is a, you know, you, you ever go to the, to the ocean and if you see a red flag on the beach, it means it's dangerous, don't get in. They saw a red sea. It was there. And I believe that what God was saying to us is that you have to learn to get above sea level. Because if you're just trying to do this based on what you can see, you'll never be able to do it. And that's why it takes the valor. So we saw the voice, the vision, and valor that finally brings us to this place of victory. Victory. And say victory. victory. Uh, it's, it's a great word because it's the evidence of a person not throwing in the towel. You have to persevere in order to come to this place called victory. Whenever you see the word victory or hear the word victory, that I was victorious here, it means that there has been an enemy. When you hear the word victory, it means that there has been a struggle. It means there has been a fight. It means there has been a challenge. It means that there has been a test. When you hear the word victory, it means that you've been engaged in warfare. If you're going to ever birth anything that God gives you and have victory in the end, you're going to go through hell and high water. You're going to deal with warfare in the spirit, with demonic and satanic thing hap happening in your life. There's going to be enemies, opponents, and all kinds of opposition. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, you can't have a child birthed in this world and then not go through stuff with your children. Uh, you're going to deal with some stuff, at, but if you're going to be victorious, victorious sometimes in getting them in school and victorious in getting them out of school and victorious in this area of your life, you're going to deal with an enemy. The word victory means that you've been in a fight. You've been in a challenge. You've been in a controversy. But victory indicates perseverance because you can't have victory if you tap out and quit. You just can't have victory if you tap out and quit. Uh, one of my children used to, uh, uh, you know, aggravate the others, trying to put them in wrestling submission holes. I'm not going to tell you which one of my children did that. <laughs> but uh, but one, one of my daughters, would, she just, she wouldn't submit. She wouldn't tap out. The others would just tap out just so he stopped. <laughs> now, I didn't tell you which one it was. <laughs> but you know, the enemy will try to put your back up against the wall and make it look like you don't have any options so that you will tap out. But when you tap out, your enemy wins by default. So don't give it to them the easy way. If you quit, your opponent is going to win by default. Perseverance, though, is a steady uh, persistence in adhering to a course of action. It is a steady persistence in adhering to a course of action. It's a steady per, uh, persistence in adhering to a belief. It is a steady adhering, a persistence in adhering to a purpose when you have perseverance. You, you're pursuing a course of action. You're pursuing a belief. You are pursuing a purpose. You, you cannot give up on this thing. You can't just give up. Persevering is the product of believing. It is the product of believing. Now, this is how I define believing. Believing is never giving up. Believing is never giving up. No matter how long it takes, believing is never giving up. I believe in God. I'll never give up on believing in God. I don't care how much opposition. I don't care how brilliant atheists are able to come and argue against it. I will never give up believing in God. You don't give up on people that you believe in. 
If you believe in your spouse, you fight for them. You stand with them. You believe for them. Even if they're doing stupid things, you believe for them. You believe. You don't give up on who you believe in. If you believe in your son or your daughter, you don't give up on them when you believe in your children. You don't give up on a cause that you believe in. If you believe in a particular cause, there are different causes that God will make people passionate about. And when you believe in the cause, you don't give up on the cause just because the cause is difficult or just because it takes a long time to come into manifestation or because it's financially trying. You never give up on what you believe in. You don't give up on a gift that you believe in. If you've got a gift to write poetry, if you've got a gift to do spoken word, if you've got a gift to do music, if you've got a gift to dance, if you've got a gift to sew, if you've got a, a gift for fashion, design, and creativity, and even if it's not paying you enough to live full time on it right now, don't give up on your gift if you believe in your gift. Are you listening to me? When you believe in the gift that God has sown into your life, you know, keep writing, keep writing, keep writing, keep creating, keep designing, keep allowing the gift of God. You can't give up on a gift that you believe in when you believe in it. You can't give up on God when you believe in God. Believing is never giving up, never giving up, never giving up. I remember distinctly in, in, uh, in the earlier years of my marriage, I prayed every single day for 10 solid years for one individual to be saved. And it blessed my life when I saw them walk down the church aisle and give their heart to Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know how many of you all, but you know, believe. I don't know how many of you believe uh, in, 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 uh, in a person to the degree that you'll never stop praying for them. It, it, to have the, the pertinacity to stand and pray for somebody for years. I didn't say minutes or hours or days or weeks, but years. And you know why I couldn't relent? I think I was duty-bound to pray for that person, to pray them into the kingdom of God because of their gifts, their callings, their anointings, their influence, their education. And I believe that God wanted to use that person for his glory, and he, and he did, and he is. And I am grateful to the Lord. I had a responsibility. I couldn't give up on them because I believed in the person. And I couldn't give up on them. I refused to stop praying. I believed in them. You show what you believe in by what you continue to fight for. If you believe in something, you can't give up on what you believe in. Even if you die fighting for that thing, you die for what you believe in. You work for it tenaciously unrelentingly, indefatigably, working for what you believe in. If you believe in something, you never, ever give up on it. You never give, it, give up on it. Believing is never giving up. It's never giving up. But victory is the outworking of your inter, inner identity as a victor, not a victim. It is the outworking of your inner identity as a victor, not a victim. Because your outlook determines your outcome. What you're looking out from will determine your outcome. See, a victor is one who defeats an adversary. A victor is a winner in a fight. They're a winner in a battle. They're a winner in a contest. They're a winner in a struggle. That's a victor. They're a winner. But a victim is one who is harmed or made to suffer from an act. It is one who is harmed or made to suffer from a circumstance. It is one who uh, is harmed or made to suffer from an agency. It is one who is harmed or made to suffer from a condition. You can become a victim of sickness and yet another person is a victor over that same sickness. You don't have to let cancer get the best of you. Fight. Don't just take it lying down. You stand up, look it in the face, and curse it out. You know in Jesus' name. <laughs> Don't just take conditions and acts and circumstances. Fight it if you believe in it. Fight for what you believe in. You fight for what you believe in. You never give up on anything that you believe in. Don't be a victim. Don't be a victim. Don't be a victim. Practically every person who is a victor started out as a victim. They had been hurt. They started out as a victim. 
Somebody hurt them. Somebody abused them. Somebody took advantage of them. It was a condition, an act, a circumstance, an agency of something that was working against them, harming them. And they started out as a victim of their circumstances. But you don't stay a victim of your circumstances. You become a victor over your circumstances. And there's one thing that happens that comes into your life that helps you to make the shift from being a victim to being a victor. There's one word, perspective. Say perspective. See, that's how you look. It's what you're looking out from. Remember Joshua and Caleb? They had a different perspective of the situation. All of them saw the same thing, but they interpreted it differently based on how they saw themselves. The ten other spies said, we are as grasshoppers in our sight and in their sight. How do you know what you look like through somebody else's eyes? They knew what they were in their own uh, eyes, but you know, if you don't like yourself, you exude self-hatred to other people and they won't like you either. You know what it's like? It is like having uh, a malodorous uh, kind of a perfume that you put on your own self and then wonder why nobody wants to be around you. <laughs> you take some odiferous substance, skunk juice, <laughs> and dabbling it here and there, and you wonder why nobody wants to be around you. See, you, you are projecting out feelings that you have on the inside. So when there is a victim on the inside, a victim attracts an abuser. Do you know abusers don't just mess with everybody? They know there's a scent. You can smell hurting people, offended people, victim people. You know, they go to people who are not healed, who already been taken advantage of because somebody took a bite out of them out, out there. Now you got a bleeder in the water. And the bleeder in the water now attracts the next shark. They smell your blood in the water, wounded. You're not healed from the last relationship. And you think that here's your Prince Charming coming to you. He's smelling your blood, sweetie. He's coming after his next meal. They took you to the cleaners and took advantage of you and hurt you. And now you're drawing into your life another victim because you got a perspective of being a wounded person who's a victim, always helpless and at the mercy of somebody else. Joshua said, we are well able to go up and possess the land. He had a different perspective. You know, he wasn't even concerned about how big the inhabitants were. He was enthralled by how big the fruit was. He was looking at the big reward. They were looking at the big risk. So you got to shift your perspective. His thing was said, have you ever seen grapes this large? He's like, look at the luscious fruit. This is a land flowing with milk and honey. He was looking at the honey over there. Isn't it amazing while he was looking at the honey, the others were focused on the size of the stinger in the bee? And their perspective, he's looking at the stinger, the ten spies were looking at the stinger in the, in the bee, and Joshua and Caleb were saying, my God, have you ever seen how much honey is just running out of this place? This is the sweet life. And he was looking at the reward. He had a perspective of being a victor. He says, we are well able. And I'm just telling you, when you're hungry, and you see something on the other side, I'm starving, I haven't eaten in days, and you got a fence up and peaches that are ripe, and I smell them blowing in the wind, and just because you got a sign up saying do not touch, and I'm starving, and all of my children are starving, and I'm, I'm getting ready to hold my shirt out, and I'm getting ready to do some picking. I understand about your sign and your fence, but I, I'm hungry, and I got some people that are depending on me that's hungry, and we get ready to have dinner. I know that there's a risk of my getting caught, but I see the land flowing with milk and honey. And so this is the way that Joshua and Caleb were looking at a total different situation. And now they come out with a different ex excitement on the inside of them, looking at the reward. They were looking at everything they had to gain, and here the ten spies were looking at what they had to lose. They're big and we're small. We are little in our own eyes and we are little in their eyes. No, no, the problem, it had nothing to do with what size they were, the eyes of the enemy. It had everything to do with the si their size in their own eyes. That's where they messed up. That's the thing that makes a the difference between a victim and a victor is their perspective. You have two people with the same issue. I've gone to some people's hospital bed dying with cancer. And then they're sitting there worshiping God. Focus on him. 
thankful to him, loving on him, and then go to another person and they are bitter, feeling like they've gotten their short end of the, of, of, of the stick. Just angry, resentful, hateful toward God. And the same God who has to heal them and now they got a bad attitude toward. It's amazing. Same condition, but a different perspective. And one is a victor and the other one is a victim. And one is looking at him and saying, you know what? God's going to heal me. And if he doesn't, I get an early promotion into heaven. If I stay, it'll be for the glory of God. And if I depart, my God, the kingdom is getting ready to get a real champion coming home. So it's like I'm in a win-win situation. When you really know Jesus, you get in a win-win situation. You're going to have the perspective that I'm going to be a victor in this situation. I'm not a victim of my cir circumstances. I'm a victor over the circumstances. And so that's where it is. Joshua and Caleb have this strange capacity of being prisoners of hope. And the wonderful thing about hope is that hope gives you energy. Hope gives you energy. Hope is, uh, is, is an energizing factor. When you lack hope, you lack energy. When you lose hope, you lose your energy. You don't even want to get up and do anything. You give up on life when you lose hope. But as long as you've got hope, hope gives you the capacity to rise up and conquer another day. It gives you the, 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 the in energy to be able to try it again tomorrow. Because you've got a hope. I hope that tomorrow will be better than it was today. And you're going after. It is your hope that energizes you. It is hope that allows you to give a person another chance. Because you believe in them. You have an expectation for favorable change. And it is that that energizes you and empowers you. But when you lose hope, you lose energy. And if you don't have energy, you can't get anything done. And people have, they can be totally healthy in their body, but they lose hope. And their bodies are just lethargic, depressed, devoid of energy. Get, get your hopes up. You have to get your hopes up. That's why the Bible says, hope thou in God. Have an expectation for favorable change, for God to turn your situation around and to make it better. Do you think that it's the, the desire of God that when you get with God, your, your life is going downhill from there? No, no, no. You ought to expect great things. You ought to expect growth. But I want you to notice a scripture here in Job chapter 28 and verse 27 in the King James Version. Then did he see it and declare it. He prepared it, yea, and searched it out. Because we're talking about the journey to victory. This is all a part of the journey to victory. And I want you to notice the elements that are involved here that you see it. See it is number one. That means you've got to have the right perspective. You've got to see it. If you don't see it, you cannot seize it. You've got to see it. See it. Then did he see it? And then notice, and he declared it. So uh, you could say it this way. You've got to see it, and then you've got to say it. You see it, and then you say it. That is a proclamation. A proclamation. You have to proclaim your intent. If you said that I'm going to win this game, you have to proclaim it. Speak that thing out. Let your speaking be in line with your seeing. If you see the vision, speak in line with the vision. Line your mouth up with the vision that's in your heart, with what you see in your heart. You see it, and then you say it. You get the plans. You get the dreams. You get the vision of this thing. You see it. And then you say it. You declare it. Let there be a divine proclamation of this thing. You have to proclaim that thing. See it and say it. See it, say it. The third thing where so often we fail is the third one is to prepare it. To prepare it. Now preparation is about planning and preparation. Think of it, think of it like a meal. You're going to have a full dinner. You have to plan the meal. Planning the meal, here's the difference between planning and preparation. Planning is, is writing out the grocery list of all of the items that you're going to need. Isn't it a mess, you know, to be in the middle of cooking and all of a sudden you realize that you, you are two eggs short? I grew up in a day when my mother used to send me next door to borrow two eggs or a cup of sugar or a cup of milk because she miscalculated and mama would be making pancakes or some cornbread or something. She'd go over there and get a, get a cup of milk. We're scared to do that now. We're scared that they're going to tell us where the grocery store is, the same one that they got. <laughs> We've lost our sense of community. But you know, professional French chefs, they have this concept called mise en place. 
It literally means everything in its place. And so before they start cooking, they have every knife that they're going to use, every spatula, every spoon, every saucer, every cutting board. They've got all of the onions, all of the peppers, all of the mushroom. They've got all of the beef. They've got all of the vanilla extract, all of the flour. They've got all of the butter. They've got all of the oil. Everything that they need, mise en place, everything in its place. So they don't get halfway down and then up. You know why? Because they prepared. They prepare before they prepare. So that every element, every pan, every saucepan, every boiler, everything that they need is already in place. Every potato, every grain of, of, uh, of rice, everything mise en place, everything in its place. That's a part of preparing. It's amazing how we, 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 we want victory, but we prepare for failure. And so they prepare the mise en place to get everything in its place. Everything in its place. They start planning and preparing, gathering the resources of everything that they'll need in order to be able to make the meal. You've got to have all of these things in place. That's the planning. So you see it, you say it, and then you prepare for it. You don't get what you want in life. You get what you prepare for. If you want to have a great meal, you have to prepare for that. You've got to have all of your ingredients. Now, I know some of you are creative and you run out of stuff and you improvise. <laughs> I understand that. But you have to improvise as a result of poor planning, poor planning, poor planning. Because if you've got a real impressive dinner that you want to do for somebody, even if you have to, you know, you have to uh, cut back over here so you'll have the money to buy all of your ingredients. You have to do what's necessary in the planning and preparation stage. They then did he see it, and then he declared it, he prepared it, and then number four, they searched it out. And you see, Joshua and Caleb did all four of these. You've got to search this thing out. Figure out ways to be able to do that. When you search it out, this is about perseverance. It's about perseverance. So when you see it, you're doing one thing, and that's about perspective. When you say it, you're saying this thing. When you say it, notice it's about proclamation. The prepare it is about planning and preparation, but then when you persevere, that when you search it out, that's about persevering. It, it's meaning that I'm going to find a way, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up, and I'm going to get out, and I'm going to get going. That's about persevering. I'm going to pursue to make this thing a reality. When you get ready to marry somebody, you have to search some things out. You have to search some things out. Everything negative that you'll ever discover in a marriage, the signs of it were present in the courtship. You have to learn how to search these things out. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner.